<laughs> um, all right then. There's always a chat too on the side. <laughs> okay, that's that's private. Yeah. All right. For secret messages, messages, messages. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for joining us once again. I'm Sammy K. Powers, and I'm sick. This is the PHP Roundtable. This is a live podcast of developers discussing topics that PHP nerds care about. The ultimate goal of this podcast is to learn a little something from each other. If you're listening live, want to be a part of this little shindig, send a tweet to the PHP Roundtable with a question, and we'll try to get your question answered live on air if we can. But my computer died, so I don't have my standard way of like monitoring all the notifications. So I might not actually see your notification, but I'll do my best. I actually didn't even send out the live tweet, live now tweet, which is happening right now, speaking of Twitter and having technical difficulties, and now it should be out. Sweet. Before we jump into our topic of the day, I wanted to let you know, in case you didn't already, that the PHP Roundtable elephants are officially available for sale at phproundtable.com. And I checked this morning, there are 118 left in stock for sale, 118 left until Christmas or something else maybe, I don't know. If you use promo code AUDIO, you'll get $5 off of every elephant you buy, and they make great holiday gifts for your favorite PHP people. So check out phproundtable.com and get your PHP Roundtable elephant before they're all gone and never here again unless we reproduce them, which is not likely because I spent a lot of money on them and I'm not even going to break even, but that's okay because it's not about that. It's about sharing love. So I added this episode, PHP Fig 3.0 is the name of this, this episode. I added this back on October 24th, 2016. This episode has been <laughs> on the PHP Roundtable website for over two years. We kept pushing it back and pushing it back, but guess what? Today, we're not pushing it back. We're doing it. We're doing this episode all about the PHP fig. There's been a lot of big changes happening within the PHP framework interop group, AKA the PHP fig. Today we chat with a number of figgies to get the inside scoop of what has changed. And we're also going to get a glimpse of inside the latest accepted standard, which is PSR 18, the HTTP client interface. Just super excited. Now that we know that what we're talking about and in my best deep sick voice because I've been working on this deep voice for the past week of sickness. I'm feeling better, but my voice is not quite recovered. Let's introduce the sick voice with Larry Garfield, the man in the vest, or the man with the vest, or the man in the vest. Which one is both it, Larry? Work. Okay. Both are true, and I'm also <laughs> the guy with a round table elephants on the round table because that's meta. Yay! <laughs> that is super meta. <laughs> We also have Samantha Quinones. Samantha is a director of engineering at Skillshare and a member of the PHP Fig Core committee. Welcome, Samantha. Hi. Thank we you. also have joining us. Oh, thank you. We also have Tobias Tobias Nyholm. Tobias is a Symphony Core and Care team member and author of PSR 18 and co-founder of HTTP Plug. Welcome, Tobias. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. We also have Matthew Wirofini, who writes the tools that PHP developers use to build their applications from APIs to content management systems. Welcome, Matthew Wirofini. Hello, everyone. Thanks, you all, for joining again. You all have been on before uh, for various episodes. And um, we're going to make mention of a few episodes that started all these um, some of the things that we've been talking about are going to be talking about. Um, the very first one, if you haven't already checked out episode number 41, this one was recorded back in uh, March 9th, 2016. We talked the PHP fig past, present, and future. So if you want more information about uh, general information about the fig and what, what they do, check out that episode. You'll get the full scoop. But just um, for those who maybe just want to get a TLDR of the PHP fig, what is the PHP fig and, and how did it get started? What, what, what's, what's its deal? I can jump in here because I was there. Uh, <laughs> uh, we were it's there, man. With a group of us at uh, PHP Tech. Uh, I think it was 2009. Um, bunch of framework developers and uh, Marco Tabini, who hosted uh, PHP Tech at the time. I said, "Hey, maybe it would be good for you guys to get a room." Uh, so we got a room and uh, kind of argued about things and came up with uh, what ended up becoming PSR zero. Um, which is a, a standard for auto loading. And that, that was basically it. But the idea behind it was, hey, there's probably a bunch of stuff that we're doing similarly, and maybe we can 
offload some of the stuff that we all do the same uh, and create standards out of it, and that was the idea. Um, there was some pushback even then. Uh, one of the members uh, wasn't quite sure about the autoloading uh, back then. For those who don't remember the ancient days where we didn't have namespaces uh, and we had these pseudo namespaces with underscores, which meant your class names were you know screens long. Uh, we had autoloading that broke on the underscores. And now with Pi.3 coming out at around that point, we also had uh, actual namespaces with uh, our standard backslash operator. And uh, we needed some way of autoloading classes from whether they were pseudo namespaced or regularly namespaced. Uh, and at the time, uh, we had the pushback, and I went and developed an autoloading implementation that would actually work and developed the, um, the specification that would detail how that was going to work so that everybody was going to be able to use the same autoloader if we wanted. Uh, so that's how we started, and then it was like years and years before we did anything else. <laughs> <laughs> So this episode is named PHP Fig 3.0. So all the things you just described, I guess, would be technically PHP Fig 1.0. I guess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we never even had a name. We didn't even come up with a name right off the bat. It was a little bit long uh, before we we actually did the acronym. Um, but yeah, that was probably 1.0. 2.0, I believe, was around the time that we first started actually naming them uh, PSR 0, PSR 1, that sort of thing. Um, and that was uh, at that point we had the ability to vote um, members in uh, and also to vote directly on the um, specs themselves. So 2.0 was you had to submit an application to come into the uh, organization saying, okay, here's who we are, why we think that we're a good fit. And then once that happened, as we developed specs, uh, they would go up for a readiness vote uh, and everybody who was in that group would vote on it and it needed a two thirds majority. I'm actually going to disagree slightly with what yeah, Fig 2 was. You can totally disagree. I, I view Fig 2. <laughs> yeah. I, I, view, I, I coined the term Fig 3 based on the workflow process. So Fig 0 was like, uh, or Fig 1 was like Matthew said, the, um, uh, the, the original founding where everything was just kind of amorphous and you know things just eventually got voted on. Um, eventually, the group decided that, hey, having an editor for a spec who was in charge of that spec, and they were actually the one who decided what was and wasn't in the thing that was going to get voted on, uh, was a good thing. And so we started doing that. And that's that's what I've what viewed as FIG2, was the second workflow process. And then uh, FIG3 was the big change that took most of uh, 2016 to put together. And then Everyone slept through most of 2017, but it's gotten really <laughs> active again in 2018. And uh, I'd say Fig's in, you know, do doing pretty well these days for itself. 2016 yeah. was a really exhausting year. Yeah, it really was. Everyone needed a, needed a rest. It's been exhausting <laughs> since, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I'm curious, what were some of the issues with PHP Fig 2.0 that inspired the changes for PHP uh, Fig 3.0? So there were a couple of issues that uh, we were seeing. One was a, a lot of it came down to no one could actually agree on certain things about how FIG work, worked. For example, um, were members of FIG projects or were they people or were they people speaking on behalf of a project or were they people speaking on behalf of themselves who got to do that because they were part of a project? It was never actually well-defined. And so no one could agree, you know, who do we, who's supposed to be involved and um, what are they supposed to be saying? Who, what perspective are they supposed to bring? Uh, another problem was, you know, we had the one editor for a spec, but okay, that's one person and one other person who are needed to say, hey, the spec is worth actually looking at, um, but not, is it, you know, good? And those people are not necessarily the, the domain experts, uh, which was a problem then because all of the FIG members were voting on a spec to approve it or not approve it. But were those the members who, sh are those the people who actually had uh, a stake in a given subject? Um, and really, you know, different specs, you want different people in the room. If you're doing a spec on, um, say, async handling, which is what we keep talking about doing but have never actually done, 
then quite frankly, you should listen to Chris Pitt more than you listen to me. You don't want my opinion on that. That's my opinion is not valuable. Chris's is way more valuable than mine is. On the other hand, there's other specs where my experience with Drupal and with Symfony and, and other things is way more useful than someone who's you know, never done an HTTP application. And you know, anyone you mention, there's cases like that. So how do we get the right people in the room for a given a given spec to say that you know it's it's going to meet the actual needs of what this particular spec is trying to address rather than you know random people who think they're cool and to try to address all of these kind of at once um, we developed uh, the fig3 model which is a large overhaul of how fig operates that essentially uh, was a just separation of concerns we broke up broke off the uh, managerial part to the secretaries, which technically the role happened shortly before Fig uh, Fig Three happened. Then we split off the core committee, who are you know, senior, respected people in the PHP community, um, who can act as kind of a steering group <clears throat> for the organization, and they have final approval on on specs. But the bulk of the work on any given spec happens in a working group, which has to be at least five people, who don't have to be Fig members, except for uh, a sponsor who has to be a uh, member of the core committee, but the other four or more can be anyone involved in the topic of that spec. So uh, when you're working on, say, PSR 18 for uh, an HTTP client, you really don't need input from monologue or composer in that. That's not really relevant. You want input from Guzzle. You want input from Buzz. You want input from other people doing HTTP clients. So get people doing HTTP clients in a room, regardless of whether they're officially FIG members or not, and you know, give them a place where they can hammer out what they want to do in common. Um, and that's kind of the, uh, the, the model now, is that kind of separation of concerns between the secretaries, core committee, and working groups. And I'm done ranting now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it sounds like, aside from restructuring in internally a little bit, it sounds like you're listening to more people outside of the, the FIG core committee or people who are a part of the FIG, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah the idea is so that it, it's, it's very porous, and you, know, you want to listen to a different group of people depending on what it is you're talking about. So it, it's a way to get those people in the room. Yeah, so is there like an official process of bringing those people in or do you all reach out to the people that you're like, oh, this library is um, you know, popular in packages, we need to reach out to the maintainers. Uh, how do you go about pulling people in from the, the general community? It kind of happens organically. The editor should be doing that work because uh, they should be doing the research in order to do it. Uh, but the other person who uh, likely does that stuff is a sponsor uh, because they're the ones who have to go to the core committee and say, hey, we're ready to vote on readiness. and yeah, we actually listen to everybody <laughs> and because uh, they don't want to people on the core committee going, hey, wait, what about this group or you know this framework or whatever? So uh, it ends up being the responsibility of the editor and the sponsor chiefly, but uh, it happens pretty organically. Uh, people will often come up and say, hey, I'd like to be involved in this. This is what I'm doing. And we're like, okay, that sounds great. Come on in. Uh, here's where the discussion happens, that sort of thing. Um, the other part is that you get uh, drive-by pull requests uh, from people <laughs> that you don't even know who aren't even part of the working group, but often have something very important to provide to the, uh, the specification. And so we go and we are able to incorporate that. Before, a lot of that stuff was happening uh, kind of in private repositories and whatnot. So uh, this allows that to happen uh, in a more structured way, I think, and keeps everything transparent. Uh, I would also say that it's not always organically. When I did PSR 18, I was trying to get, I mean, I, I researched which were the major libraries that did HP clients. And then I, f I find my shortlist of six, maybe. And uh, then I try to convince them, hey, you should be in the working group because you have, you're maintaining this major library. And most people said no. Because at this was at the time where the fig was very toxic. Well, I mean, also PHP internals are also very toxic. And people said, hey, I want to stay out of this. I don't want to have endless discussions with these random people that Larry mentioned. And they, they didn't have, want to do anything with FIG. 
So I convinced them, they know that's that's fig two, this fig 3.0 now, that's a totally different story. And after I convinced them, they said, sure, let's let's build a working group together. So I want to say, if you're trying to make a new piece of anything, don't assume that everything happens organically. You should also pull in some work. Right. Well, that's what I said to the, the edits, uh, job of the editor and sponsor, and you were editor on that particular one, uh, to go and find those people. But the, some of that also happens again. Yes, sure. Process. Yeah. Combination of the two. Yeah. Sure. yeah I think the, the key there with, with the, the updates to the governance is that we kind of separated the concerns of like the actual content, the work, the governance, and the, the administration. And those are three pretty clearly defined functions in big three. Yeah. Whereas in fig two, I mean, the very end, uh, when fig secretaries became a thing, the kind of administration was fairly well defined. But in fig three, there's a, a very clear distinction between who's responsible for doing the actual work, who's responsible for keeping the organization up and running. And we've made the governance process much more streamlined and much more, uh, more much more well defined because it was a little bit. I think some of that toxicity came from the fact that there was it was open to so much. Everything was open to so much debate. And one of the things too is like you had this huge group of people who are members, and uh, you've got something like, say, for instance, the container spec. Well, there's a handful of the groups are actually interested in that, so the rest just don't even vote. And all of a sudden, you're left with the point where I don't actually have enough votes to get this through. How can that be? And it's just because people are just not voting in this particular case. And so you get you get uh, you know a quarter of the people voting uh, get yes, and all of a sudden we have quorum because uh, we we had enough people. You know all the people who actually voted, voted yes. Uh, and so now all of a sudden it goes in and only a quarter of the people actually voted, kind of like a US election. So we wanted to- <laughs> <laughs> It's funny because it's true. <laughs> yeah. One thing to clarify, there are still member projects, uh, but they are now very clearly the project is a member and they have a representative whose only real job is to elect the core committee. And if a spec comes up that is relevant to that project, then you know they, they get a, an easy on ramp to hey this this is a a spec that effect directly it directly affects our project or our project has a lot of experience here we want a, a seat at the table cool okay you're a member project you get a seat at the table Let, let's do this um, so there are still member projects it's just a lot less I don't want to say relevant they're a, they're they're a lot less day to day important to the operation of Fig. Um, they're still there as a kind of sign of support for FIG itself that, um, you know, FIG still does have community buy-in and support to be doing what it's doing. But being a member project, being an idle member project doesn't hold the group back anymore. Cool. Yeah, it seems like there's a lot of progress being made under PHP FIG 3.0 with the new restructuring. And there's been a number of accepted um, PSRs that have come through. Specifically, the the most recent one, I believe, was PSR 18, right? There's nothing has happened since PSR. Okay, good. Just making yeah. sure I didn't miss anything there. Um, so I can't, maybe to help us understand the, the restructuring of what happened with uh, FIG uh, 3.0, how did PSR 18 get um, sent through this new process? Oh, how? I mean, first, we um, sh should I give you some story about HP Plug? Absolutely. So HP Plug were an organization founded like 2015, 2016. And we thought there should be a solution to the Gussel problem, which at the time was some libraries depending on Gussel 5, some on Gussel 6. And you, you, couldn't, you couldn't depend on both. So we were a group of people that made an abstraction over this, which basically have used one or two interfaces. And we pushed out a lot of libraries. We got some support, or we got plenty of support, and some that didn't really like this. Anyhow, a few years went by and like 7 million downloads. And we thought, hey, let's make this an official standard. Let's make this a part of the PHP fig. So as I said, I, I, um, I looked out which are the major HP clients, and I try to find representatives. And when I finally convinced them that, hey, let's make this together, I um, then then I, we wrote the draft, and oh, we, we found a sponsor, and that's that to make the process. Oh sh no, I should. We find a sponsor, and we voted to get accepted. And after we got accepted, we worked and had the draft. And when that draft finally was completed, 
we've asked like the fig like hey can we can we make this an official an official spec now they said sure just make sure to test it properly so it was kind of a beta phase for like a month and then we try then we make sure that this spec was implemented in in the wild and after that we went back to the thing and said hey let's i mean our our spec is uh, proven now it's been using by these organizations and you should really accept this so then the core committee took their final vote and said yes this is good enough and uh, and then it was an official uh, psr and i mentioned this in two minutes it in fact took two years <laughs> we've had some go through there, there's actually faster. some go through faster than others uh, and it often is dependent on the editor and uh, how the editor is able to keep the working group going quickly and you know honestly a lot of the um, a lot of the ones that are going through right now actually started before the 3.0 process and sure they had it in. Uh, and as a result the it did take longer because that part of it was we just weren't doing anything for a year or two there while we reorganized and then uh, everybody was like, okay, how does this work now? Uh, so <laughs> we finally get to that point and uh, they're going through more quickly. Yeah. It's one thing to note there uh, that, that Tobias, Tobias kind of glossed over. Um, there are three different votes uh, involved to getting a spec approved. There's the core committee votes to charter the working group and say, oh, okay, yeah, yes, we bless working on this thing. We, we agree this is a, a thing that should be. Then the working group, you know, works it, on it and does its thing. And eventually the working group votes and says, yes, this thing is good enough. We're ready to pass this back to the core committee and say, hey, we, we think this is good. And then the core committee votes again to say, yep, yep, this is really good. We're going to, you know, stamp it and say, yes, this is a, now an official PSR spec. And I believe all three of these votes are two third majority. So for a spec to get approved, it yeah. it needs to have pretty broad support from the involved people uh, to say, you know, yes, this is a thing. Yes, we're okay with it. Uh, it's it's been tested. There are implementations showing that it actually works, which is something that uh, was sometimes a problem in the old model. We had a, a spec or two that got <laughs> out when, and then people tried to implement it and realized, oh, that doesn't actually work, and end up is not good. Um, so that it's a lot, a lot more quality control uh, than there used to be. So when a, fe a spec is approved, uh, it, it's been vetted three times by three different group of people. Yeah, well, two different groups: two core different committee, different yeah, core working committee, group, yeah. working group, core committee. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's it, it does have at least some level of broad support simply by virtue of getting that far. Um. Yeah, and this might seem complicated, and but there, there's a document that uh, explains this pretty well. So if you spend 10 minutes to read the document, you ex you understand all of it. I mean, when I'm listening to us, I, I feel that this is fairly complicated. But it, it is, it's a lot, but it's a document explaining it. Yeah. I don't know that it's any more complicated, though, than it ever was. It's just it just it spelled out and, and clear now. Yeah. yeah. It, it's one of those cases where adding formality to the process really did make it better and actually made it easier to understand. Uh, because now you, you can just look at it and say, oh, this is what the process is. It's written down. Yeah. And there's a requirement of two implementations before it goes to that readiness vote with the core committee. And that is huge because you can spot problems pretty quickly uh, during those implementations. I know that as we were working on the middleware interfaces, for instance, we noticed something that was just not quite right as we we're doing the implementations and we actually threw it back. Uh, and said, okay, we need to make some changes before we go to that writing this vote. Yeah. That's cool. So kind of looking at specifically PSR 18 a little bit, it is the HTTP client interface. And I believe this is a complement to PSR 7, the request response interfaces, which came out uh, several years ago. Uh, and I was looking at the interface, it looks pretty simple. It's, a, it's essentially one method called send request, which takes an instance of request interface and it returns an instance of response response interface. Uh, so is that is that pretty much all there is to PSR 18 aside from like error handling and things like that? Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, cool. it took us two years to come to that conclusion. Uh, yeah. But yeah, that, that that's pretty much it. Uh, that's awesome. Yeah, so I mean, so PSR 7 came out like four or five years ago. And, yeah, oh, four years ago, three years ago, anyhow. 
Yeah. So <laughs> it was beginning of, so we, it's almost four, almost yeah, four almost years. Four. Anyhow, so we could, we, we, we could, we had objects for responses and requests, but we have no way of interacting with them or no like agreed common way to interact with them. So that's, I mean, we created PSR 17 to be able to create them. And now we have PSR 18 to be able to send them, to, send them somewhere and get a response back. And yes, it's, the interface looks very simple. It's just send request. And uh, the only thing you need to need to know is whenever you send a request, you will get back a three, oh, you can get back a 301 response, like a redirect response. Uh, you will never get back a 100 response. Uh, and your client will never throw any exceptions on if you get a 400 uh, response back. It will always return your 400 or 500 response. So it's very predictable. It's basically, you will always get back a response, and the client will do its very best to actually send the request. So, so it's it, very, very, very small, simple. It seems very simple, but the part about it is, you know, as you start doing the implementations, you know, that one of the questions came up: should we be throwing exceptions for those 400s and 500s? And we start having discussion about like how do people actually use it? And that's where the that's where that time comes in. It's like people play with it and start thinking what would actually be useful. And uh, it may seem simple, but you know, having those stipulations in the spec help people know that this is exactly what I can expect every single time I use this. Yeah, because some people might feel it's, it's super convenient if the server th it returns 500, you should throw an exception because that is an exception to through your flow of uh, your programming. However, if you're writing a small client that tests if the server responds 500 or not, you don't want to get an exception, you want to get the response back. Yeah. So, I mean, it, you should basically to this define how a client should behave and to find a common ground between all other clients. And that's what took some time, indeed. Yeah. A, I think a it's lot important of the hard part. To not, Go ahead. I think it's important to not look at the actual, like if you look at the, the body of the, the PSR, that's an artifact. And it's important. But what really what's really important here is that this is a recommendation uh, that was put together by a group of people who are very close to this particular domain, thinking about this, talking about this, playing around with it, doing uh, experimental, experimental and reference implementations. And this is the recommendation that they've come come back with. With this is the right way to to execute this particular, um, you know, this particular workflow. You know, sending and receiving a response. So. It, the, the artifact itself is very, very simple, but but the value in it is all of the time that was spent by the working group members to really think about how is this going to behave in the real world? How are people going to interact with it? Uh, what is what is our best recommendation for a standardized way to do it? Which people who are the end users, like we do that in our jobs as engineers all the time. This is kind of a, a way to um, save a little bit of that time and effort uh, of having to go through that phase of experimenting with different uh, ways of approaching a problem. And I think a lot of the value of a good specification is not just the the actual interface definition itself for those specs that are an interface definition. It's the stuff that you can't capture that way. Um, like, you know, PSR 18 is just one method, but there's also error handling should be done in this particular way and not this way, because that's also part of interoperability. You can't capture that in the interface, but that's still super important. So if you want to implement uh, a spec, you need to do more than just look at the doc blocks on the interface. You need to look at the whole spec and say, oh, what behavior is expected behind it? What's the um, other things I'm expected to do so that I conform to the expectations that a user is going to have? So that you know, the, the goal is, as a consumer, I can say, hey, I'm going to need an HTTP client as part of this project. I don't care which one it is. They're not just going to conform to the same interface if I switch from one to another. They're also going to handle errors the same way. They're going to handle uh, timeouts the same way. They're going to handle these edge cases the same way. And a conforming implementation means that I, as a consumer of an arbitrary PSR18 client, really don't care which one I'm dealing with. That's the goal. Uh, the, the goal for most of these PSRs is so that independent libraries can leverage a PSR in order to plug into any of the various PHP sub ecosystems they want. And that means more than just the interfaces, it means the behavior behind them.
And that's, I'm really glad you all spent a lot of time specifically on the error handling thing. I, I think it makes a lot of sense to not throw an exception a lot of times, especially when I'm getting like a, a 422 or some, I can't remember what the, the response code is for like the, the data validation or unprocessable entity. And you have like actual useful data that comes back in that body. That's like this specific piece of the data blob is, is not actually valid or something. So I'm parsing that data and by default, some of the other HTTP clients throw an exception for 422s and my code breaks because I just assumed that it was gonna like actually give me a response that I could play with. So I think that's really awesome that you all um, did the research and found that the best way to kind of process those um, or what the community expects for um, HTTP client implementations. Um, do you, now that PSR 18 has passed, what does the landscape look like for uh, libraries adopting this? Um, it's, it's funny because libraries adopting this, there's only like five clients, HP clients that support PSR 7, which oh, wow. is very, very little. Uh, say we have, we have the send one, we have Gussle, we have bus, we have bus react, wind walker. We have two other, three others from HP plug and half of them are maintained by the same number of people. And the other half is basically sitting here around this there's, table. <laughs> there's four or five implementations, but that makes up like 90% of the market though. Indeed, indeed, which makes this piece of hardware kind of special in that way. Mm -hmm. um, so the adaptation is basically already done. It's, it's very simple. It's just, uh, it's just, it's, Sorry, what am I saying? The adaptation is quite simple. We'd make sure it's quite simple. We make sure it's, you, all libraries can implement this in, in this simple PR. However, the issue we was having, the major issue with this PSR was the PHP 7 issue. Mm -hmm. So HP plug has been around for a few years and we thought, hey, let's take all the things we tested, everything that was great with HP plug and make a PSR of it. Everything was great. I was about to ask the figure like, hey, can we make this official PSR now? And then someone suggested we should implement <laughs> the <laughs> command to PHP 7 only. Someone, no Someone. names. <laughs> which, which is a good idea indeed. However, that means that it technically will be a BC break yep. because the interface would have, I mean, we should have client interface with one method that send request that should return a response. And this return response means that it's in, incompatible with HP plug technically incompatible HTTP plug. And we're like, oh shit, how do we solve this? Because we promised all the HTTP plug users that if this ever make a PSR, it will be a very smooth transition. And we promised all the libraries implementing HTTP plug, like they will be super simple to Im implement HTTP plug, uh, the uh, PSR, PSR when you implement the HTTP plug. So how do we solve this issue? Uh, so that was our major, major um, thing that, 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 that was the thing that took a lot of time to, to figure out. And a lot of testing, a lot of, yeah, a lot of testing, a lot of researching, a lot of late nights came to the solution that if we release HPlug 2.0, something we said we will never do, we release a new major version of HPplug, then it will all go well if that major version also implements the new PSR. So you're asking me about adoption, and yeah, you're all confused now. I get it. It's <laughs> <laughs> we promised everyone HP plug will never change, and now we're releasing a new major version. Uh, however, the only thing we add that new major version is we drop PHP 5 and we add the return type on the interface. That's the only thing we're changing. So it's not a busy break, or it's technically a busy break, but nobody will ever have an issue upgrading. So the adoption, all Everyone using HP plug should accept HP plug one or HP plug two. I mean, you, you, you can, that sorry? Is, that consumers should, people implementing it have to upgrade. Sorry, people, yeah, the people consuming HP plug should use one or two, like you do one pipe pipe two, and you'll be very, very much fine. Uh, however, the five clients, they need to drop PHP five and then they will be fine which everyone should do anyway at this point. Let's be clear. Indeed. Indeed. There's no reason we're mm -hmm. creating a new library that supports PHP 5. Yeah, we've got 36 days left of uh, PHP 5.6 support. So yeah. I'm something, like, something like a week of 7.0 support too. So <clears throat> yeah, mm. if you're not on 7.1 yet, get with the upgrading people. 
so the ad adoption there, Bus is already implementing it. Uh, we are f finalizing uh, the curl client, I think, on uh, on HP Plug, and I know that Gossel will implement it during next year. Awesome, that's great. So when when Guzzle, for example, implements PSR 18, will that bump it to version 7 or whatever the next version is? Yes, it will. Okay. But it should it should be a relatively painless upgrade, right? If I'm on 6. Yeah. Uh, I mean, what else I do? <laughs> 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 uh, there, there is there, we have no intention of making it a painful upgrade. I mean, I, I imagine, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to step on Mark Toast now. I imagine we're just going to add um return types and, and the type plantation we're gonna drop php 5 and we're gonna fix some things we thought were quirky or missing min minor things but it will basically be i i hope it will be a smooth update upgrade yeah you've, it sounds like you've spent a lot of time trying to make sure that this even the interface is named send requests and not just send because that might actually break Make it harder to upgrade Guzzle, for example. Yeah, right. The, yeah, Gus, Guzzle got a send method, and if we also call our uh, method send, then would mean that Guzzle had a hard time update. So we can name it send. We, we were pragmatic and named our method send request instead of just send. Very cool. Yeah. So we talked about this uh, in pretty. Uh, a lot of detail uh, in episode 58 with HTTP plug, Guzzle, and APIs. And this was back in January 5th, uh, 2017. Um, we were kind of just talking about the trade-offs of adding HTTP plug to a project, to an open source project. Um, and so that's if you want more information about specifically HTTP plug and what it does, um, definitely check out episode 58. Um, and we and we talk a lot deeper about all that kind of stuff. Um, so any any more thoughts on PSR 18 and the, the kind of the process to get here? Um, first of all, congratulations to uh, for Thank passing you. that and all the hard work that went into it. Um, but any more any more thoughts uh, that you, that you feel like people should know about yeah, PSR eighteen? Um, Matthew, help me here. Anything <laughs> else we should mention? Not that I can think of. You've, you've covered it in pretty good detail, so. Yeah, it's. Um, I mean, it's a very it's a very simple PSR, and you, you should use it, and you should always depend on it, and so we we avoid the Gossel five six problem we had in the, back in the days. So Absolutely. respect the dependency inversion principle. Very cool. So we are uh, slowly getting to the wrap-up point, but we have a few more points to kind of point out uh, on the show notes. One, um, talking about a little bit of some criticism coming uh, from Fabian Pontier uh, on Twitter just the other day on uh, November 20th. Sorry, I have to interrupt you. Fabien yes. Pontier. Ah, thank you. Fabien <laughs> Pontier. <laughs> Sorry, I took French for 12 years so I could pronounce his name properly. I, I, I feel <laughs> I need to defend his pronunciation here. <laughs> he was one of the very first people in the PHP community I actually met. Um, and it was at PHP Tech like many, many years ago. And we were eating lunch. And I, I got my lunch. And I'm looking for a table to sit down at. And there's this, there's like two people sitting at this one table or three people. And I was like, I walk over. I was like, can I sit here? And they're like, sure. And we're sitting there eating. And they had, uh, um, what is it, Sensio Labs uh, lanyards on. And I was like, oh, do you all work for Symphony? And they're like, yeah, we work for Symphony. I was like, oh, do you code in you know, Symphony, the framework? And uh, one, of, one of the guys was like, yeah, a little bit. And then they were joking because, uh, oh, that's Fabian. He actually wrote the thing. I was like, oh, great. I didn't even know I was sitting next to uh, <laughs> this really famous person right now. So, that, um, but it was really cool. The and, advantage of conferences is that stuff absolutely. like that happens. <laughs> yeah, totally. And like everybody's just so like nice and accessible. So um, so that's really great. So uh, speaking of Fabian, uh, he was on Twitter um, saying a, a few things about the fig. Uh, PHP fig was a great way to create a common ground for PHP projects. Interoperability first, uh, PSR4 and PSR0. Auto-loading were a great start and made it possible to easily share libraries. PSR1 and PSR2 coding standards provided uh, 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 proof that projects were willing to work together uh, to cover uh, the non-critical topics. PSR 11, the container, was the best example of collaboration. Um, and so, but he goes on to say in um, some more tweets, PSR 7, 7 had nothing to do it with interop and it ended up being a spec for foundation of a new opinionated framework. And now PSR 14, which is the event dispatcher ones, which we haven't talked about, uh, might be taking the same path. Um, so I'm curious what your all's thoughts are um, from the perspective of uh, some of the PSRs aren't necessarily about interop, but are more about creating an opinionated framework. Um, 
Any thoughts on that? Ooh, ooh, yes. Ooh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, called out specifically PSR7, and I was editor on that one. Uh, well, I was one of three editors on that one, but the one who finalized it. Uh, the thing that's interesting is, you know, it started off with just going to do uh, just generic requests and responses. And when I came in, uh, there, I came in because I'd been playing with Node. And one of the things I loved about Node was that uh, they had request responses built into the language, which meant things like middleware just kind of appeared. You knew exactly what a request and response was, no matter which middleware library you picked up, whichever client you picked up, you knew exactly what it looked like. Um, but one of the things that it also had awareness of is that things are slightly different in a server side than client side. And so there's some additional artifacts that are there client side, I mean, on server side, uh, rather, uh, for things for like getting the, the body, uh, for things like getting um, routing attributes, that sort of thing. So my contribution to PSR7 was really saying, hey, we really need to focus on that aspect as well and have a separate server request that has these additional features in addition to the regular request. Uh, and as we went on, there were a lot of pe people weighing in their voices and uh, we realized immutability was a really good fit for especially middleware architectures because uh, in any change, if you look at the HTTP specification itself, it actually says any change to the message, any part of it means it's a new message. And the only way you can model that at the code level is to make the objects immutable. So any change means it results in a new, uh, a new object itself. There were certain things that we couldn't do, like the actual request body, we can't do that way because uh, streams usually depend on resources, which you cannot clone. And so we had to make a few concessions in there. The other part is like, if we assign an object to any aspect of that, it's for reference. And so if there's a change in that reference, there's gonna be a change. But those are edge cases and in some cases are useful. For instance, if I'm calculating something from the request, like routing variables or uh, CSERF tokens, that sort of thing, those are part of the request. They're not part of the application. And so they can be passed along as a server attribute. This is all my long-winded way of saying that we had a lot of people contributing to this. And one of the things that we noticed very early on is that no two libraries were doing it even remotely the same. Uh, we had the HTTP kernel from Symfony does a lot of stuff just as object properties. Uh, you had the Zend HTTP did everything with methods. You had Guzzle doing everything with methods, but they were all different methods than we were doing in Zend HTTP. Buzz was doing it completely differently as well. So we had a situation where there actually was no consensus. And we could have grabbed one of them and rubber stamped it and said, well, this is the most popular. But there were also things we were learning, like <laughs> the things about immutability. There are things that we're noticing that uh, people had problems with with any of the implementations where uh, it was inconsistent and it was easy to actually get into edge cases that would not work. So we did take some, we were a little bit opinionated in that we wanted to fix those problems at the interface level and figure out a way that we can make something that would work. Having played with the middleware ecosystem so much at this point, uh, I think the decisions we made made a lot of sense. There's some pushback still on some of the pieces, but for the most part, everything just works and it's very predictable. And that's the part that I really uh, appreciated about the spec, especially as we completed it. There were decisions I made that I wasn't sure about, that I wasn't absolutely happy about, but I think were probably the right decision to make at the time. So yes, is it a uh, new opinionated framework? I wouldn't say so. I'd say it's saying, okay, let's find a, an actual usable, consistent specification for how these requests and responses should act. Uh, so that that's my opinion in here. <laughs> so more broadly, I think there's always a tension when dealing with uh, standards between prior art and what's already out there and what would actually be a design that in encourages collaboration in the future. And those are not always the same thing and they are sometimes very much at odds with each other. And one of the questions that FIG has struggled with throughout its history is, you know, do we favor, you know, to, to what extent do we favor um, People are doing X already, therefore X will be the standard because that's what people are doing. That's the end of it. Versus, um, what you know, what would actually be a good model to encourage flexibility and interoperability and allowing and you know, client libraries and user libraries to swap out the components they're depending on or plug into arbitrary frameworks, even if that approach is something that no one is doing right now. So you know, PSR seven, for example 
was a model of HTTP modeling that no one was doing in PHP. But it's also a much better model long term for doing the kind of interoperability than any of the existing models already were. But that does create a problem when existing models then need to shift to that. And that's the tension that is just inherent in the problem space. And as part of the FIG3 charter, uh, when we revamped everything, part of the bylaws very explicitly state, uh, quote, it develops and publicizes standards informed by real world experience as well as research and experimentation by itself and others. So, you know, FIG is explicitly charged uh, by its members with figure out what is going to be best for long term interoperability, which includes looking at what is currently in use and what would be better long term. Neither one of those is a veto. But that does mean there is always that tension of, you know, it is hard to switch Symphony HTTP Foundation over to a PSR7 immutable object. This is a true statement. Symphony to date has chosen not to do so. Uh, they have a bridge library, so you can do some level of interoperability, but it's not extensive. Um, you know, that's that's their right. It is a hard problem there. But we did the same in Zen framework. It's uh, the yeah. MVC layer is still using our Zen HTTP component, which is not PSR7. Uh, and that was a decision that we had to make again for backwards compatibility reasons. Yeah, so that's, it's a legitimately hard problem space and there are good arguments to hit that balance point differently. Uh, at the end of the day, you, know, you have to pick some point to balance on. And sometimes that point is closer to existing implementations. See also PSR 11, the uh, container spec or PSR 18. Sometimes it's further away from existing implementations like PSR 7. Um, Matthew and I are on the working group for uh, PSR 14 that you mentioned, which is uh, an event dispatcher spec where we're trying to build something that is close to the existing large implementations and easy to, to transition to. Uh, so we, we very explicitly said, we're not looking to build something that is directly compatible with existing event libraries, but we're looking for something that it's easy for existing event libraries to migrate to in a graceful fashion. And again, there are pros and cons and there you can be reasonable disagreement about how well we're doing that. Um, PSR 14 is still in development at this point, so it's still subject to change. Um, but that's the kind of challenge that any working group uh, has to work on is, you know, we can't just say, oh, we're going to standardize this existing version because then you know, that, that's not fair unless there really is only one existing version. Um, is that what but you also need to monologue? keep in mind. What's that? Was it that uh, PSR 3? Is that yeah. what happened kind of a little bit? Well, Essentially. Funny about PSR3 is we had the same stuff going on in Zenlog, but I didn't even know Monolog was happening until it was already voted on because <laughs> yeah. we uh, are trying to do differently here is that we want to make sure that we actually do get input from everybody. Yeah. But uh, even in the case of PSR3, that's actually a good example. The initial spec for PSR3 was basically Monolog. And you know it, it, it looked exactly like Monolog. However, by going public with it, by making it a discussion, we were able to say, oh, what about this case that that is not handling? Here's how Drupal handles this case to, with uh, escaping and security. We should make sure that gets handled. And the way that ended up being handled in PSR3 was different than any other logging library at the time was doing it. But it was a way that was informed by what Drupal had always been doing for its logging system. So what we end up with, you know, PSR3 was not exactly any existing spec, but it was better for having been informed by multiple existing implementations, even if it was very close to one in particular. So even with PSR3 that, you know, think things through and think through different use cases, what, you know, what's going to really make it long-term interoperable and long-term flexible, um, it still happened and it's a better spec for it. So that, that's a part of the process that is always there. Yeah, I, I, just to add one small thing, um, and I, this is in no way to, to a comment on, on Fabian, who I, I both like and respect. I, I think it's 
I think we, we should always take a step back when you look at an organization like the FIG, when you're uh, talking about what it wants or what it's trying to do, it's a, there's a lot of people involved. Um, and a, a group of people this large generally will not have uh, one single solid desire from the world. I think what we're trying to do is, um, is put out into the world uh, ideas that are vetted, that are thought about, that are uh, produced transparently uh, to increase uh, the interoperability across the ecosystem. And even like calling us, us the, the framework interoperability group, a lot of the PHP community and ecosystem has moved away from frameworks and, and that's fine. Um, I think a lot of the, the biggest changes that we've had in, in, in PSRs, like PSR 7, um, PSR 18, like these things are really have a huge impact outside of the world of mm -hmm. uh, monolithic frameworks and are much more about the interoperability of the individual libraries that a lot of developers are using to build applications from. So I, I don't I don't think anyone involved in the FIG has an, has a motive or an agenda. And we're certainly not trying to create a framework. Um, at least I'm, I'm I don't think anyone here is trying to create a framework. Um, <laughs> It's almost the exact opposite. It's moving away from from frameworks to uh, a set of a set of agreed upon recommendations that lets libraries and frameworks talk to each other. Um, so I think honestly, like PSR seven is one of the the best things that happened for oper interoperability in the broader PHP ecosystem um, in in a decade. Like it's 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 a it's game changing. Uh, because it, it was such a if you move between symphony and and um you know other other frameworks and other libraries you constantly had this cognitive overhead of trying to figure out how this thing handled http requests um and but having you, one standard is important but you're talking about the concept of psr7 not the implementation details of psr7 exactly like the the the, the purpose of it yeah I think what an important point there, and echoing everything Samantha just said, is a spec that can have that positive impact, even if it's not universally adopted. I mean, PSR2, the coding standards, there are people who hate portions of it, including me, but it's still the most widely used coding standard now in PHP. It's not universal. Drupal hasn't adopted it, WordPress hasn't adopted it, and that's in terms of number of installs, that's a majority of the PHP world right there, just between those two projects that don't use PSR2. PSR2 has still been a huge success in terms of I can pull in a random PHP library and I don't, my brain does not have a parse error just because the coding style is different. Uh, so even with non-universal adoption, these things can still have a huge positive impact on the ecosystem and that's still a win. Mm -hmm. So I just looked this up. Uh, PHP Tech 2015. We had this episode 20. We had uh, PSR7 cake to celebrate the passing of <laughs> yeah, that was PSR7. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I remember that. That was that was good good times and good cake. Um, <laughs> so it, we are at the top Rub of the hour, in. so we really do have to. What's that? Rub it in. I wasn't there. <laughs> yeah, I, I know. I know. Right? It was. The we cake had cake was in your amazing. honor. <laughs> I got a picture of the cake if I remember correctly. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we should have had a fig cake. That would have been even better. Um, so one of the uh, things I want to kind of like really wrap up on here because it is uh, time to wrap up. Uh, if somebody is listening and they they think all this this stuff about like getting recommendations pushed through that affect a large percentage of the community. Um, how, if this sounds exciting to you like to get involved and be a part of that, how would somebody who isn't a part of the FIG um, get involved? Join, Join the mailing list. Yeah, go to uh, php-fig.org and that has uh, all the information for how you can get on the mailing list uh, and uh, other things. Go on there, find out what the specs are being used, uh, find out how you can uh, get involved with uh, the various working groups if possible. Go and uh, look and see what, um, we have a, uh, two different folders within the repository for uh, the specifications. One is accepted and the other is proposed. You can go into the proposed ones, review them. Uh, see if you can create an implementation uh, and share your, uh, you know, your experiences with it and uh, send pull requests if you see something that doesn't make sense and start a discussion. Yeah. I think 
the the thing that most working groups need most is people begging on it to find where you know this doesn't make sense i don't understand how to implement this part what do i do here you know we want to know that uh if you want to be a member of a working group then you know the main thing i would say is don't look for somewhere you have opinions look for somewhere you have experience you know if there are plenty of things i have strong opinions on but i don't have the experience to back them up but uh, you know, if, if you you may not be known in the community, you may not be known in Fig, but you've been working with this particular problem space for ten years. Uh, let's say you know, you've written queuing libraries. That's another example I tend to use. Uh, and so you've got a lot of experience with all the edge cases where de dealing with queuing servers, uh, you know, is break. It, it would, it's going to break. And you've got a lot of experience there. Then you know you'd be valuable on a queue spec working group. If there were one, uh, even if you're not, you know, working on Symfony or working on Zend or working on Laravel or working on WordPress or one of the other big names, if you have experience in that problem space, that's valuable, and you know, we want that experience from different parties who have, who have the battle scars, uh, so we know, okay, how do we make sure that no one has to have a battle scar again in this particular area? So, you know, think of what experience and. Uh, Hard, le hard earned lessons you can bring forward. And, um, you know, if that, that's where you can be, where, where you want to be helpful. Is there any particular type of uh, person that you're looking for right now that, that, that could fill a particular niche or, or two? We have elections coming up in February, is it? Yeah, I think so, because I think my, uh, my slot's up in March, if I remember correctly. Yeah, uh, so we have elections coming up for the core committee. Uh, so the, the core committee is elected in three uh, separate groups uh, every eight months. So it's a two-year term staggered, kind of like the US Senate is. Um, so that we, you know, we only roll over a few people. Uh, there's four core committee seats and one secretary seat up for election. Uh, for secretary, we're looking for people who are really good organizers, not necessarily great coders, although that's also good, but the secretaries are primarily administrative, managerial, organizational, um, you know, user group organizers, conference organizers. Those kind of people would do really well as secretaries. For core committee, uh, we're looking for people who are um, experienced and ha good at thinking of the big picture. Um, not necessarily in every nitty gritty detail, but how does this spec fit into a big picture? Has this spec um, been you know, gone through the process and brought in, you know, at least listened to uh, the you know, competing viewpoints. Maybe not made all of them happy, but at least listened to. Is this, you know, are there edge cases that the spec hasn't uh, found yet? So that really good, really strong generalists uh, make good core committee members. If you feel that's, you know, either of those are you, get involved, start joining the mailing list now, and then when nominations open, uh, stand for nomination or, you know, or stand for election. Or if there's, you know, you're working in a space where you think, hey, this would benefit from standardization, um, talk to other people in that space. If, you know, a, a group of three or four projects who are all working in the same area come to the FIG and say, hey, we want to make a standard for us all to use around X and we're all on board with it, that's like guaranteed uh, working group approval. Um, it's a chart of the working group. We love it when that happens. Uh, we, we want to be the place that facilitates that kind of, hey, we want to work together and stamp it as official. But that's good, yes, please. Very cool, very cool. Well, we do need to wrap this thing up. I uh, want to uh, point out that if you want to contribute to the PSV Roundtable, there's an open source project you can check out. If you go to github.com slash PHP Roundtable, there's a repo there called show-notes. I've forgotten to mention this in the past like 20 episodes, but it's still there. Um, and uh, used to get lots of contributions, but then I stopped like commenting about like that it exists. So definitely check it out. Um, write down the, um, as you're listening, if you just want to write down some notes in Markdown and then send, it, send it as a pull request to show the show-notes repo on uh, github.com slash PHP Roundtable, uh, I'll pull it in and give you credit live on air, uh, give you a big shout out. Um, and typically we have a developer shout out, which is an amazing uh, 
a segment that recognizes developers and the community for being awesome. We don't have one uh, for, for today because we don't have a sponsor. I think 2019, there's probably going to be quite a few sponsors lined up. Um, so there's quite a few sponsorship slots available for the end of this year. Actually, there's two specifically because I think December is the last month and this uh, this is the second episode for November. So there are two open sponsorship slots, at least for this year. Um, so if you're interested in sponsoring the developer shout out, Definitely hit me up. Uh, I'm Sammy K on Twitter. And let's wrap this thing up with some shameless promotionals. Let's start off with Larry. You got anything you want to shamelessly promote? Well, I think I'm contractually obligated to shamelessly promote my employer, platform.sh. We're a continuous deployment cloud host. Um, you know, you push to Git and you know, with, with a config file that says, hey, I want this set of additional servers and I want this version of PHP and I want uh, this web server configuration and poof, you get all that built with containers and you want to change something, you change it and push again. You want to clone the whole thing, you push a button and you now have a complete copy of your site code and data in two minutes, something like that. So you can uh, you know, use your Git-based workflow for content as well and just experiment, try things out and you know, a merge is a safe way to deploy even on Fridays. So we make deploying on Friday safe. <laughs> now that's platform.sh. Nice. What about you, Matthew? You got anything you want to promote? Uh, expressive, uh, because we're talking about FIG. Uh, it has been a huge consumer of that. We've got uh, PSR 11 support, uh, which is a container interface. So of course, uh, PSR 7, uh, which are the request and response objects. PSR 15, which is middleware. PSR 17, which is the uh, uh, request and response factories, uh, PSR 3 for logging, and uh, let's see, what else do we got? Uh, PSR 1 and 2, of course, PSR 4 for auto-loading. Basically, it's a standards-based framework, um, and it uses middleware, and you can basically adapt it to whatever you need. And the uh, URL on that is getexpressive.org. Excellent. What about you, Samantha? You got anything you want to promote? Uh, yeah, also I'll uh, promote my employer, Skillshare. Uh, we are an online learning platform um, and we are hiring. We're looking for uh, great engineers who want to join our, our really cool team, uh, either in New York City or wherever you happen to live. So uh, you can head over to Skillshare.com slash careers. Uh, I gave a link to, um, to Sammy, also gave a link. Uh, my colleagues, uh, Joey and Kyle, hooked me up with a two month free trial promotion thing. So the other link in there will get you two months of uh, Skillshare for free. Very cool. And what about you, Tobias? Anything you want to plug? <laughs> what <I'm from. laughs> yeah, I want to. I want to mention Symphony Costs. I think it's a great. It's a great platform to consume videos about P Symphony and also modern PHP. And they they have a, a great number of free tutorials you should check out. Very awesome. Great. Well. Uh, for our next couple of episodes we got lined up, I think PHP 7.3 is here, is the next episode, which I haven't lined up yet officially, but hey, PHP 7.3 is almost here. Uh, we're going to be doing all things Drupal, and then we're going to do a live accessibility audit of the phproundtable.com, so you can see how badly accessible it is, and you can make fun of my code, but we can all learn from it. And then we'll have an all things Magento episodes, and then a why dates and times are so hard for developers episode, because dates and times are always biting me in the butt, and I'd like to talk about it. If you have something you'd like to share about a specific topic of PHP nerds care about, send a tweet to PHP Roundtable or go to phproundtable.com. There's a form there you can fill out and be like, let's talk about this. And I'll be like, OK, thanks so much for Larry and Matthew and Samantha and Tobias for joining us in this discussion. And we'll see you folks in the next episode. Peace.